Here on Trek Central, we have been focusing a lot recently on the ships of the future. I mean, that's somewhat of a given because we're 21st century people looking at Star Trek of the 24th and 25th centuries, but that's not what I mean. I mean, we've been looking at things that are at the bleeding edge of Federation technology in the late 24th and early 25th century, but what about the ships that came before? That's right, you asked, we listened, it's happening. Let's take a look at some of the pre-Federation's best interstellar transports. Welcome, lords, ladies, and sovereigns to Trek Central. I am your host, Lieutenant Adam, and before we warp into this video, as always, if you want to keep up to date on all the latest Star Trek news, lore, and more, then please do make sure to hit that subscribe button to never miss a video here from the team at Trek Central, and you can also follow us on social media for daily updates on the Star Trek universe. And again, we are still nearing that milestone of 100,000 subscribers that we've been chasing so dearly over the last few months. So if you would like to do us a solid and go ahead and subscribe to the channel, please do it. And a huge thanks and great appreciation for the support of all the new and existing fans that have all played a part in getting us to where we are today. We could not do this without all of you. So by all means, please do consider leaving a like, a comment, a sub, share with anyone you know who loves Star Trek as much as we do, and enough of the shameless self-promotion, let's get on with it, shall we? Now, it's been a long road. No, no, no. <laughs> sorry, I won't go there. But as a immediate spoiler alert for this, and a bit of a sorry not sorry as well, the NX-01 is not on this list. Yes, I know, it's technically a pre-Federation ship, but we've touched on it a lot before, and we wanted to cover some new ground here. So let's just accept the fact that their time has finally been, and we'll instead focus on the ones that got us from there to here, or here to there. I'm just going to stop before I end up quoting the entirety of that song. The first ship we're going to look at wasn't even technically a ship. It is one of the only ships, though, to have appeared in the real world. We are, of course, referencing the Orbital Vehicle 165 Enterprise. It was an American space shuttle orbiter, kind of, and it was operated by NASA and active at least until 2024 in Star Trek canon. Which, yes, I know, doesn't exactly line up with real world, but whatever. The real-world Orbital Vehicle Enterprise was, of course, OV-101 and was only designed to take part in landing tests to make sure that the design of the space shuttle could handle approach and landings. But the OV-165 belonged to the, quote, second generation of space shuttle orbiters intended to be the successor to the Enterprise-type shuttles, or space shuttles as we would know them in real life. It was designed, of course, to be a single stage to orbit or SSTO vehicle, and the ship was used for launching commercial and scientific satellites, as well as bringing components to the interplanetary vehicles into orbit, such as the Shango X-1. This ship was about 40 meters in length, operated by five crew, and had a maximum speed of 27,000 kilometers per hour, just a little bit slower than Voyager then. Being a shuttle, it had no weaponry either. But in a continuing homage to the original space shuttle program, it actually carried the orbital vehicle designation 165. 1 meaning that it was flight ready, and 65 meaning the 65th in the shuttle series. This program of course began in 1976 with Enterprise OV-101. The earlier shuttles used rocket boosters, whereas the OV-165 was given the nickname of Spike due to its quote, kick-ass aerospike engines that use less fuel according to René Picard. Although you may not know that aerospike engines are in fact a real-world technology that is slowly creeping its way toward the mainstream in rocket science. Yep, Star Trek is not the only form of space nerdery that I have indulged in. But apparently, one of the benefits of this fictionalized real-world technology was that it did not require a solid booster rocket that needed to be jettisoned mid-flight, unlike its predecessors. The OV-165 had a lifting body design, meaning that the body itself produced the lift, instead of the wings. The fact that it had small wings meant that they caused less drag and were more suitable for atmospheric re-entry. 165 was often used for cargo transport, which was released from payload doors on its dorsal side, just like the regular old space shuttle, and it could also be modified to carry passengers. A metallic thermal protection system shielded against the intense heat that built up during re-entry and was safer and cheaper to maintain than the ceramic protection system used on the earlier shuttles, 
which required thousands of hours of maintenance to check and replace the countless ceramic tiles that composed the exterior. Even the slightest crack or imperfection in even a single tile could make all the difference for the survival of re-entry for everyone and everything involved, and sometimes even on launch. This class of shuttle was a vital stepping stone in the development of spacecraft, as humans sought to develop technology that would allow them to explore the solar system and beyond. Once an idea had been established for the opening titles for Enterprise, the producers asked John Eaves to come up with two ships that would fill in the missing pieces between the real-world shuttle OV-101 and the fictional NX-01 Enterprise one of which was the OV-165, which is seen releasing from a docking arm during Linda Park's credit, and the other following the Phoenix, which became known as the SS Emmet. The ideas of this shuttle influenced Eve's designs for what would later become the Warp Delta. Evolving from the real-world-inspired designs toward our first truly fictional spaceship here, the Shango X-1 was an early 21st century multinational spacecraft assigned to the Europa mission. It was named after the Yoruba people's god of thunder and lightning. The vessel was designed by the scientists and engineers of the Argosi Foundation, and according to the January 1st, 2024 edition of the LA Times, it was robust enough to withstand the radiation and sensitive enough to gather data needed to investigate Europa's environment. And now we go back to the future. Oh, uh, sorry, I think I just made you think we were doing the DeLorean. We're not. Sorry. It wasn't spaceworthy anyway, that we know of. The Shango's launch was nearly halted due to the actions of one Noonien Sue. No, not that one. Adam Noonien Singh, actually. No relation, by the way. But he wanted to ensure his legacy, which I can't blame him for. I mean, granddads will be... I mean, what? Shango was launched in 2024 for a three to four year journey to Europa, where it carried a twin payload of a lander and an automated probe. The lander transported five astronauts to the European surface, while the automated surface probe melted through it and explored the global subsurface. They would find a microbe on the European surface which would allow a clawback effort to clean Earth's oceans and skies from the damage caused by climate change. Personally, I think the better way to go would have been for some kind of strange cosmic energy to hit the ship while it was on its way to Europa and give the five astronauts inside horrendous cosmic powers. But alas, the show's creators didn't listen to me, and so the Fantastic Five never came to be. Among the astronauts taking part in the mission were Doctors Musa, the mission commander, and Rene Picard, a mission specialist, and Maya Orlando. The X-1 wasn't created, in fact, by our usual team of Doug Drexler or John Eaves, or even a repurposed Matt Jeffries concept. It was created by Felix Bartel, several years ago for a short film, which was then co-opted for use in Star Trek Picard. Next up, we take a look at a truly ugly Enterprise. Uh, no, not that one. I'm talking, of course, about the XCV-330, the one with the funny-shaped front end, the long shaft-like hull, and the bizarre pair of rings at the back that can only have been inspired by an eyelash curler. While it hasn't been given an official launch date within televised canon, into Darkness shows us a gallery of ships displayed in Admiral Alexander Marcus's office, giving a chronological order of a line of ships. It's displayed after the Ares V, but before Phoenix, suggesting a pre-warp ship, and indeed, launched before the Phoenix, though the Eagle Moss official Starships magazine states that it was launched in the 22nd century and was an early warp ship of the XCV-300 program. But, bluntly, I tend to take anything that comes from Eagle Moss with a grain of salt nowadays, and we'd best leave that there. But do you see what I mean about trying to figure out canon here? What's real, what isn't? Ugh. It also does have a nice painting that can be seen in the motion picture and Star Trek Enterprise, though, so it still makes the list. Yay. To give fair attention to it, its class is unknown, its top speed is unknown, and its launch date is unknown. Trek Central sincerely hopes you find that information useful for whatever purpose you require. Oh, all right, fine. Its top speed was less than warp four, it was completely unarmed, and it was launched sometime before 2143. So take your pick of the prior 42 years, and I guess Marcus just needs to figure his ship out. And yes, I said ship, YouTube, with a P, as in Papa or Picard. Papa Picard? No. 
Other than that, though, we know next to nothing about the first ship to bear the name USS Enterprise, except for the sailing ones. Because why would we? There's so many first ships to bear the name now. And that's putting aside the fact that the somewhat vague launch date would have still smacked it right in the middle of the United Earth ship designations, not as a Federation ship bearing USS. The rest is a mystery. One that I really cannot be bothered to try and unravel. So let's move on. The XCV-330 was originally designed by Matt Jeffries in 1979, his early sketches not being too dissimilar to the final design when you take a look at them side by side. And though it appeared in the motion picture, creating its own entity, it has genesis in the early days for the production as one of the first designs for the Constitution class. And even though we never got to see one flying on screen in the proverbial flesh, its shaping did influence the design of Vulcan ships or at least those seen in Enterprise. So I suppose it really was a Star Trek ship in face at its heart. Doug Drexler also put forward a design for the Enterprise NCC-1701, which was a hybrid of Jeffrey's concept for the XCV and what we have come to know and love as that first original Enterprise as we know it today. The XCV is presumed to have a conjectural drive called the annular warp drive, Instead of conventional nacelles, a ship equipped with this would have a large hoop-shaped field generator. On one of Jeffrey's drawings, he even labelled it the Dinertia Propulsion System. Some media, such as the 2011 Ships of the Line calendar, describe the XCV Enterprise to be a radical reinvention of warp technology based on Vulcan principles. It proved to be 17% more efficient than Vulcan ships, however had trouble turning at high warp thus making it impractical for exploration where sudden course changes would need to be made and ultimately considered a technological dead end in Earth starship design, and this would then place the XCV as appearing after the Phoenix and First Contact. The Okudas, two of my favourite people on the entire planet, included the proverbial ring ship in their reference book The Star Trek Encyclopedia, where they identified it as the SS Enterprise. Otherwise, the XCV-300 was effectively forgotten until the art department resurrected it. When Rick Sternbach was designing a Vulcan ship for the TNG episode Unification, he deliberately made the engines of that ship hoop-shaped as a tribute to Jeffrey's design. Getting away from silly territory for a while, we finally look at a slightly more familiar ship that we'll all have recognized from First Contact, the Phoenix. The first human-built experimental warp ship designed and built in the 21st century, in the Star Trek universe anyway, real worlds running just a bit behind in that, by a ragtag team of scientists and engineers led by Dr. Zephram Cochran and Lily Sloan, inside a missile complex in Bozeman, Montana, coming in at over 30 meters long and approximately 20 without the rocket booster. The work on this revolutionary vessel was completed in April 2063, approximately 10 years after the Third World War and its ceasefire. The Phoenix fuselage was built from a modified nuclear missile, and Cochrane replaced the warhead with a 4-meter cockpit module. Uh, actually, that's not 100% correct. Sloan replaced it with the cockpit module, which she took months just to scrape together enough titanium to build. Never forget! Despite its advanced technology for the time, though, the Phoenix looked little more than jury-rigged. Most of the materials were not specifically built for it, but rather scavenged and modified from various sources. The interior of the cockpit walls were lined with various controls, similar to how airline cockpits and even rocket cockpits look in the real world today. It was accessible to three crew, dependent on their seated positions. One of the most important devices on board was, of course, Zephram's music system that allowed him to blast his tunes during launch. The ship was fitted with an intercooler system, and versions of many other systems became common on all warp-capable ships, which included the intermix chamber, the warp plasma conduit, and of course the fuel manifolds. Once out of the atmosphere and the first stage rocket booster was exhausted, the entire lower half was jettisoned, followed by four metal covers which detached from around the forward hull and revealed the two warp nacelles, which extended once clear of the discarded components, and the warp core and plasma injectors were then brought online. In the years following the first warp flight, which altered the future of humanity by making first contact with the Vulcans, Cochrane's theories were taught in schools one of which was actually named Zephram Cochrane High School. 
among the alumni of whom was, of course, Geordi LaForge. Once again, it was John Eves tasked with designing the Phoenix, which personally I think makes him the greatest bookender in Federation history, as he was also tasked with developing the latest and greatest in Federation history, the Enterprise E. As usual, faced with challenges which included making it convincing enough to have been built as humankind's first faster-than-light vessel, whilst also becoming a template for future designs of Starfleet, notably the NX test ships Alpha, Beta, and Delta, Eves also knew that it had to come from an adapted Titan missile. And get this, the production team even managed to find and redress a real decommissioned Titan missile in a silo for the first Contact movie. Eves climbed every ladder and peered through every hole possible. Michael Kuda had an extensive library of books about NASA and detailed just about every rocket ever made, including one with the dimensions of the Titan. This took Eves back to the drawing board, concentrating in particular on how the ship, which the script described as having nacelles, would fit inside a missile and how having broken loose would convert into a ship capable of warp speed. After all was worked out in that regard, he was then to fashion the nacelles to look similar to the original Enterprise, including the Orange Bussard collectors, in a bid to make a connection between the two time periods. He succeeded in this Herculean effort spectacularly. And all in all, it just goes to show why I continue to refer to John Eves as an undisputable bloody legend. Finally, we come to the NX test ships, which John Eves would get his hands on too. Can you tell I'm a fanboy yet? Have I made it overwhelmingly obvious enough? Just wanted to be clear. Though his initial pass of these designs was very plane-like, it had two winged nacelles, a catamaran-style fuselage, with the capsules suspended in the middle. It had your Star Trek elements, of course, but it was an evolution of the X-plane. Being the next step towards starships, Eves didn't think massive boosters were appropriate. Tony Moore of NASA suggested that they piggyback another craft, more or less an evolution of how the space shuttle was once carted to and fro on the back of a 747, or in a slightly more modern example, the Strato launch. Designs of an experimental aircraft called the X-48B were also shared, which prompted Eves to design two ships. The X-48B inspired craft to launch the NX to near orbit, and the NX herself. However, it couldn't be justified to build two ships instead of one, so it was also decided to make most of the budget, the nose end of the Phoenix was reused, because all importantly, it made sense, being a direct descendant. In the years following the successful flight of the Phoenix, the United Earth Space Probe Agency merged with Starfleet and set up the Warp 5 program. As the name suggested, the scheme was to design and develop a Warp 5 engine. The program evolved into the NX project in the 2140s, as the engines were to be tested in prototype starships. Then came the NX Alpha, and later the Beta and Delta. The warp engine Archer was working on was eventually installed on the prototype starship, the NX Alpha. In 2143, it was ready for its inaugural flight, with several Starfleet commanders in competition to pilot and break the Warp 2 barrier. The NX test ships were approximately 20 meters long, roughly the same as the Phoenix in its second stage. It was similar in appearance, too. The cockpit module at the nose was near identical from the outside, rightfully so, as it was reused. However, on the inside, it was vastly different, only featuring seating for two crew, and the interfaces were much more sophisticated. Though the cockpit had a pressurized atmosphere, the crew wore full spacesuits in case of sudden depressurization. Although, what they were supposed to do when they were in the vacuum of space was any bugger's guess. Behind the cockpit module, the NX still had a cylindrical body, but it had short and much more advanced nacelles attached to thicker, articulated, wing-like struts. The main difference is the rear end. While the Phoenix used a rocket booster, the NX ships used rocket-like propulsion to launch along a horizontal sled track with an almost vertical ramp at the end. The combined effects of the launch system powered the ship into orbit, and the boosters remained a part of the ship rather than detaching and falling away. The NX Alpha broke the Warp 2 barrier, reaching a top speed of Warp 2.2 .2 in 2143, 80 years after the Phoenix achieved Warp 1. The ship was destroyed after problems arose with the field stability, though, and the order to stand down the flight was, naturally, ignored. 
the want of all test pilots everywhere, it seems. The blame for the malfunction was put squarely on the engine, though, threatening to put the entire NX program on hold indefinitely, much to Vulcan's emotionless delight. There was actually nothing wrong with the engine, though, rather the ratio of the matter-antimatter intermix. Intent on keeping the project alive, the NX Beta was appropriated without authorization, <clears throat> and launched to the same threshold as the Alpha, bringing it to the same speed where the problem with the warp field stabilization arose. But this time they were able to correct the intermix ratios and reached warp 2.5. And in true Maverick fashion, this unsanctioned flight kept the project on track. Yay. Almost two years later, the warp 3 barrier was broken with the NX Delta, which in turn led to the first warp 5 engine for the NX-01 launched in 2151. Again, against Vulcan's wishes that humanity defer to their judgment, which we'd been doing for nearly a hundred years. Solid historical record there of Archer demonstrating the eponymous Archer Burn Maneuver, which, funnily enough, was not in the repertoire of the Warp Delta. Not to be confused with the NX Delta, the Warp Delta was an escort-type vessel of the United Earth Fleet launched after the NX test ships, but before the NX-01. They were 130 meters long and complemented with 30 crew members, a top speed of warp 3 and armament consisting only of plasma cannons, with its only protection being hull polarization. The name came from the shape of the ship, which was triangular and bore a resemblance to the uppercase Greek letter Delta. An upswept wing on either side had a short nacelle, reminiscent of the test ships, and when the Deltas were launched, they were only capable of Warp 2. However, advancements in Warp technology quickly saw them upgraded to engines that could handle Warp 3. An early variant of the Delta had multiple rocket-style engines on the rear of the main body, which upgraded as propulsion technology improved to more advanced impulse engines that were obviously much more efficient and enabled the ship to be maneuvered with greater speed and precision. The bridge, in conventional Star Trek style, was on top, but located more toward the front, as opposed to the center of the dorsal hull. There were very few windows along the edge of the vessel, as the rest was covered with, at the time, armor plating, which could be polarized by the application of electromagnetic power, making the hull several orders of magnitude tougher than its non-polarized state. Its plasma cannon armaments could also be discharged in the form of a beam or a burst. Warp deltas were primarily used as the defense fleet of Earth and outlying colonies, which came in handy when a cloaked Klingon bird of prey randomly decided to attack and disable an unsuspecting Enterprise. They were fought off by a small fleet of Delta and Intrepid ships, which luckily were still on high readiness following the Zindi probe attack. Eves created an evolution of the OV-165, with some nacelles thrown in as the inspiration for this design. The main body, of course, being delta-shaped, and at least four different illustrations were drawn up for how the aft of the ship could look, from glowing impulse-type engines to the multiple rocket-style exhausts, which we got to see in the opening credits of Enterprise. The deltas that defended the NX-01 against the Klingon ship were the updated design of the aft to have impulse engines, and help sell the idea that it was a more advanced version of the vessel. If you look at it head-on, or I suppose arson in this case, you can see an obvious lineage to the aft view of the NX-01. But that about wraps up for five of the pre-Federation's best ships, so if you're lucky we might do some more, or ask politely, as one of our commenters did to prompt this video, thanks very much, we will gladly make more request videos. If you want to keep up to date on all the latest Star Trek news, lore, and more, then make sure you hit that subscribe button and never miss a video from the team here at Trek Central. You can also follow us on social media or join the community Discord server. But for now, I've been Lieutenant Adam, thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time. Live long and prosper, my friends.